Good afternoon, Irene. Good afternoon. Hey, friends, you're watching Brainstorm Acres. I'm Henry. And I'm Irene. And I'm hiding in my sweatshirt today because it's cold. <laughs> no, I have on my long sleeve <laughs> wool shirt. We're going to talk some about starting seeds. It's getting to be that time of year, and now is the time to gather your equipment and any supplies you need. We've placed our final, what should be pretty much our final two veggie seed orders. So when they roll in, we should be done with that. I'll probably still need to pick up some more flower seeds, but we will have pretty everything pretty much in, in order. We've got plenty of seed starting soil. I may pick up another one, but we're well on our way to, to be able to handle all of this. And that's kind of brings us to what we were talking about together today, which is we got a comment from a watcher on YouTube who was is a novice at this, and they there's nothing the matter with being a novice. We all start off as novices at some point, right? But they they use some random soil to start some seeds. They got less than 50% germination. Now, without knowing about the seeds, I mean, that may be fine. If they're older seeds or if they've been stored improperly, that could be fine. But And some seeds companies don't have the greatest yeah, germination rate germination to start rates with. Germination anyway. But the description was basically the top of the soil was covered with white fuzz and the few seedlings that did come up died. Well, there's one thing is for sure. When you have white fuzzy stuff growing on the top of the soil. This is a bad thing. <laughs> this is a real bad thing. Definitely not a good thing. So we promote the use of seed starting soil for starting seeds. Uh, for years, I used potting soil and it generally, if you've got a good quality potting soil, will work. But the advantage to seed starting soil is that it's finer and it usually has better watering hold, water holding capacity and it's just, it's just generally easier to work with. We've used multiple varieties. Right now, our seed starting soil is all coming from Haas Tools. We simply toss in a bag of that as part of just about every order we place that we, we always have some back bags on hand. I should mention at this point, there is a link in our show notes. If you're going to order from Haas Tools and you order more than $25 worth of stuff, there's a code thing in there. There's a special link and there's a code thing. And if you go in that way with a special code, they'll send you a free pack of seeds. Well, they'll do, the that. Thank you. they'll do that one time. Just so, one time. So on your first order that's over $25, right. you can get a, a free package of seeds. I think it's a rainbow chard, isn't it? Yes, it is a rainbow chard. That link that you're using to, to sign in through is an affiliate link. It does not cost you a dime extra to buy your supplies through that link, but it does give us a little bit of a boost. We get a very small percentage uh, anytime anybody orders through that because we have introduced a lot of people to Haas Tools that wouldn't have known that they existed before. Well, you know, one of the things about, about seed starting mix, I never used to use seed starting mix for many, many, many years. No. The ordinary potting soil always worked fine, mm -hmm. but there's been a bunch of changes in the industry over the past five or 10 years and definitely in the last two or three years. And we're seeing it not just in here, we're seeing it in the UK and every place that people are complaining about the quality of the potting soil. Uh, it's dirty, it's contaminated, it's sterile when it shouldn't be. <laughs> when well, I mean sterile, I mean there's nothing nutritious in it for your seeds, all that kind of stuff. So. By going with a seed starting soil, you usually pay a little bit more for that, but you're only using it to start the seeds, not to pot up. Yeah, so we just use it in the cell trays that you've seen Irene use a bunch of times. Right. It doesn't take a whole lot no. to fill them up. Now, when we do the 162 tray, it takes a lot more material than when yeah. we just do a, 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 a six or eight or 24 tray. Right, but I think the, I think the, uh, the 162s, you can, I think you can fill two of those with one of the bags from Haas. And, and we've done it before and it, it did work. It did work just fine. We highly recommend the use of a good quality seed starting soil because even if you have the greatest seeds in the world and you're careful about your water source and everything else, 
And how disappointing is that to have fuzz come up and it kills your seedlings? Now, you used to work in a greenhouse and they did not use, how did they handle their soil? Well, many, many, many years ago, this is probably 55 years ago, so a good long while mm -hmm. ago. The owner of the greenhouse bought topsoil and peat moss, and those were mixed together in a specific ratio, and then it was moved from that outside pile into an inside room in his greenhouse, and it was steam sterilized. By steam sterilized, I mean he had a room that had steam pipes in it to heat it up, and he could actually in inject steam into the room in addition. So that's a really great way of doing it, but you probably don't have that technique at home. Right, well steam is still actually considered to be one of the best ways to sterilize soil. So if you can't afford to go get seed starting mix of some sort, you can use ordinary potting soil or even soil from your garden if it's good quality. And the way you, and this is where I've done this not with steam before, but with an oven. And I tell you what, having done it that way before, I will go find the pennies, even if I have to eat more spaghetti, to go get the soil because it's a pain in the behind. If you use an oven, you have to uh, bake it at 180 to 200 degrees Fahrenheit or 82 to 93 degrees C for 30 minutes in a tray that's less than four inches deep. And it, it needs to have a teeny bit of moisture in it, but not be soggy. And we have to wait until the soil temperature in that pan gets to 180 degrees. And I'll tell you what, it smells bad. Yeah, 180 degrees for those of you who do some brewing or do home canning mm -hmm. or make sauerkraut. Right. 180 degrees is kind of that cutoff Magic. point. It <laughs> kills a lot of yeah. yeast and, and bacteria. It doesn't kill everything. It doesn't kill viruses. So right. don't count on this to kill a virus. No, it will not kill a virus, but it'll kill your bacteria. It'll kill all your mycorrhizae. It'll kill your, your seeds. So if you've got uh, weed seeds in there, it'll kill them. It'll kill bug eggs and stuff like that. Uh, if you do want to use the steam method, they say you can use a pressure cooker. Yeah, if, if you do home canning, you probably have a pressure canner. That just means you put a container inside you that. Put the rack in there, and then you put a tray of dirt on top of it. Put some water in it, yep, and do crank it, it up, now. and cook it. But you know what? The oven works just fine. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I'm pretty sure that Irene wouldn't like it. I sure wouldn't like it if I put soil in the oven and baked it. I have it, done it, it before. I actually did it when we lived in California because we were having trouble with something and I had read that this was a great way to do it. And I did it, this was a really long time ago, my kids were babies, and uh, man, it stunk. You know, there's, there are friends of ours that, that do use oven sterilization. It is actually sterilization mm -hmm. because they'll crank the temperature of the oven up to 300 to 350 degrees and let it bake. And that will kill everything. Everything. Yeah. It is important to have soil that is clean. You don't want any kind of, you know, people will, are all excited these days about mycorrhizae and the soil and stuff, all the funguses that are good for your plants that help the plants to develop and create symbiotic relationships with everything. And that's cool. But the kind of stuff that causes fuzz and kills your seedlings, not cool. So plan ahead. We were down at a big box store just the other day. They had all their seeds in. They had potting soil. They had compost. Now, this compost was down to about half a pallet, but I assume they're going to have more coming in. But you don't want to wait. I wouldn't assume. You know, yeah. if, if you see something that you need for gardening and you can afford it, buy it then because it. it may not be there later. We basically chose to afford it even if we couldn't afford it. I put it on the credit card because... Uh, I'm concerned about the availability, always, always, even in a normal pre-COVID existence, there were years, pretty much every year, when somewhere between April and May, you couldn't buy potting soil or compost around here for love and money, because everybody would have realized it was springtime, it was time to do things, and they simply don't have that much back stock at most of these places anymore. They rely on just-in-time delivery. So then you go to, you drive all your way down there. For us, it's, you know, it's over an hour drive. We get down there, and they are out. In terms of basic supplies, we've always tried to plan ahead 
And the last couple of years we have definitely planned ahead. We picked up a whole stack. I think I picked up 10 bags of mulch the other day. Uh, is that enough for the garden? Nope, no. Not a chance. And especially since we're reworking the one bed. But some of the beds don't really require much anymore, like the carrot bed doesn't really require much. All I do to that is, is clean the weeds off of it and fertilize it. Now, you know, we had a really interesting mm, happenstance, mm. and that was aphids. Oh, yeah. Yeah. A, a friend of ours uh, gave us some seedlings mm -hmm. to use in our greenhouse, and what happened? Well, I check them over because I always check over seedlings no matter where I get them from. Because like when we have bought, there have been a couple of times we went down to a big box store and Henry said, hey, how do the herbs look over there? And I'm like, watch. And I waved my arm like this and you could see the legions of white flies white coming flies. up. And he's like, oh, back away. And I'm like, yeah. And I've found spider mites. Oh, yes. We've, we've found yes. pretty much everything. In fact, we, we occasionally see those nasty thrips and those nasty aphids. Mm -hmm. uh, usually at the big box stores, it's white fly and spider mites for some reason. The, uh, the aphids are fairly rare there. Thrips, they're endemic. I mean, they're just in the air here, so. The problem with aphids is that they don't stay in one place. No, they, they fly in. They fly, so yep. no matter where you live, you can have aphids show up on your doorstep overnight. Yep, yep. in fact, we discovered that I'm not going to remember the name of the plant. It looks like a giant dandelion. Instead of a little dandelion puff about that, it gets one about that big. And it's they, gorgeous, gorgeous plant. Yeah, I pull them out in the yard. They attract aphids. There will not be an aphid to be seen. And you go over to that plant, and if you check the nodes where the leaves come out, there will be aphids all over the place. And it's, it's funny because aphids come in different colors. And the aphids we have in the greenhouse right now, well, had before I sprayed in the greenhouse, the bodies of the nymphs were a tannish brown color. And knock on wood, we caught them before they got to, to the flying stage. Uh, the ones that we see on the weeds in the yard, and also if we grow fava beans, we get the or broad beans, depending on which country Those you live in. Those are the black in. ones, aren't they? The black ones. They, they call them black fly in Great Britain. And they're our type of black aphid. And that's the only time I've ever seen them here. Uh, we, the, the peppers here will usually get a green aphid you know, if we're going to get any. Aphids are a really interesting insect. Their, their life cycle is not terribly different from many other insects. An egg gets laid often in the soil, can also be on the plant. The egg finally bursts forth with a lovely little nymph that's mm -hmm. going to climb up the plant and start sucking on the plant mm -hmm. and getting the, the juice out, which is interesting because we'll see ants. And when we see ants, I always follow them because uh, the ants around here will run aphid farms. And we've seen that before on the oh, beans. Now, what do you mean by an aphid farm? Well, they actually act as farmers. They will actually take care of aphids and, and make sure they're doing well because they will eat the honeydew, which is a sweet, sticky substance that the aphids will put out. So one of the ways to actually control the whole cycle is we will put down, we will spray the aphids, but we will also put down something for the ants, a sugar and borax, borax right. solution, which you allow to dry. And then you put that out where the ants are tra traipsing through. They'll take it back to their, their nest and kill the nest uh, because the ants can become a problem in and of themselves. And yeah, so it's just one of those weird things, trying to break the cycles. So they, the ants can go off and be happy somewhere else, but they're not in my flower beds and they yeah. bite. Yeah. Now, aphids have about a seven day life cycle. They'll, they'll emerge, the nymph will go up on the plant, they'll do their business eating and sucking all the juice out of your mm -hmm. plant, and then they will molt and the resulting insect is a flying insect. Mm -hmm. You can use neem oil to control aphids. Now, when we have aphids out in the yard, in our raised beds, we just go about controlling them. We don't try to eliminate them because they're gonna fly back in anyway. Right. We All we try and do is keep the plants under control enough so that the, the we'll get the fruit, whatever it is, off that plant. So, you know, I'll spray once a week, but I'm not gonna go crazy. 
and in between if I find something that's annoying me I'll hit it with some water or something like that just to knock it off soapy water just plain soapy water or if you want to use insecticidal soap you know that's another thing you can use yeah. <laughs> neem oil works great now mm -hmm. there's two different ways that neem oil can be taken out of the plant that grows the neem pods one is uh, cold press that's just a big press that squeezes the oil out of those uh, out of the fruit and the other is expeller pressed mm -hmm. you see the same thing with all the cooking oils and stuff so you're, you're generally speaking off better with the cold pressed mm -hmm. than the expeller press the reason why the expeller press is it's faster it's cheaper they right. get more oil out of the biomass and oftentimes when they expeller press they also use a steam extraction which heats up the active ingredient now I'm not sure that that's actually going to make a big difference but what does make a difference is the concentration of the active ingredient in the resulting oil right that's why I always tell people that they need to read the instructions on their individual package because just because it says neem oil doesn't mean that your neem oil is the same as my neem oil you have to actually read each individual package to see what the concentration is and what the dilution is because this stuff is diluted before it's put on a plant Another thing you need to be careful of with a lot of the insecticides is if you're spraying with neem oil, you should not be spraying when it's going to get super hot. So, for instance, if we're having trouble either in the greenhouse or in the yard and it's, you know, hot, it's in the 90s, we will wait until, well, in the, in the garden, we'll wait until after sunset so we don't accidentally hit any pollinators. Yeah, we're out there with headlights and, <laughs> and flashlights, yeah. In the greenhouse, I can turn on a light in there and I can do the same thing. Some of the other things I've used before is we have a pyrethrin which will work on aphids and we have a pyrethrin that is, is suspended in canola oil, which is a great solution because anytime you add oil to a natural insecticide, it makes it stick to the leaves better and therefore stick to the bugs better. So, you know, you read the instructions. It comes what down to it. Your, your best neem oil is going to be cold pressed. If you can't get cold pressed, you can use other neem oil. Cold pressed neem oil is pretty readily available. It's slightly more expensive than expeller pressed. Some of our gardening friends swear by only cold pressed. Some say use both. You know, as I Irene says, whatever I've used, <laughs> you know, what was available when I was looking. And pretty much for us, that's been the cold press because that's what those particular brands do. Right. And there's a couple things about neem oil and pyrethrins and other things like that that you need to be really, really aware of. And that is they are incredibly toxic towards amphibians and any kind of fish life. Mm -hmm. So you want to make sure that you don't have overspray. Now we don't exactly have we don't have we don't have water sources near us, but when I worked at the Bosque del Apache National Wildlife Refuge nine thousand years ago, uh, that they used uh, pyrethrins to kill fish. So if you have an invasive fish species species of fish that that's what they would the Department of Interior use to to kill off the fish in an area because it had as few consequences as could be imagined. In other words, it would be gone within a day or two. It would just kill the fish that were there. It had no left res no residue left behind or anything else. So it was a quick, you know, fix for clearing out invasive species. You have to be aware of that because if you're in an area where like, well, when we lived in California, the drains on the side of the road said, this goes to the ocean, you know, uh, because the storm drains drain the water from the streets and they go down into the bay. So you, obviously you don't want any kind of overrun. We're dry. I'm spraying in a pot, or at worst I'm spraying in a bed. And I'm still being super cautious, as Henry said, when we are spraying outside in the garden, because there's times when we have to use something like a neem. We're out there after dark, so there's no pollinators. We've got headlamps and flashlights. You know, it may sound silly, but I have never found a dead bumblebee or honeybee from me spraying. And I'm very cautious about that. It's one of the reasons I don't like to, squash, to spray my squash plants once things have gotten really going, because sometimes the bumblebees will sleep yeah, in the squash flowers. Yeah, they'll get inside the squash flower and, sleep and, in there. and you won't be able to see them necessarily. Well, you can see them if you peek in, but you can't avoid every squash flower when you're spraying. 
So, you know, it's just, it's one of those spray as little as possible, but when you have to do the best job you can. Yeah, you know, we had a question about drenching soil with neem oil or other products and Neither, we, I've we, never don't, done it. we don't drench our soil, mm -mm. Uh, but if you're going to do that, and I understand it is an effective technique, yes. follow the instructions from the manufacturer. We right. have no help on that. Yeah, yeah. Um, I remember reading about soil drenches for getting rid of uh, the June bug beetles and stuff like that, and it was just totally beyond us in terms of water capacity and all that other sort of stuff. You're really soaking the top few inches of soil, and that's just not an option here. You know what time it is? Yes. So be sure to like, subscribe, and hit that notification bell, because obviously we have a ton going on. Yeah, I don't even know what's going on now. I've got a list as long as my arm. <laughs> maybe uh, longer. <laughs> two arms, maybe. Yeah, yeah. Meanwhile, I'm going to keep hiding in my sweatshirt because it's cold out there today. It's, it's, the temperature's not that bad. I think it's about... It's pretty bad. It's, it's, I think it might be up to 45 now. But the wind chill's been really bad today. It's just been, uh, we should have had snow and we didn't, but it left us the cold, so. Say goodbye, Irene. Yes. So until next time, bye. bye. Keep brainstorming. Yep, always.